Good morning, everyone. We have uh, just a brief update today, and then we'll go into questions. I wanted to reiterate that I understand how difficult this has been to all Vermonters. We're a little over three months into our response to this global pandemic, and almost two months into our efforts to reopen in a measured way so we don't lose ground on the good work to slow the spread. As I've said many times, we know the virus is still here. It didn't magically disappear. It's still among us, which is why we must continue to place restrictions uh, on, uh, in order to smother the embers that exist with COVID-19. So we don't have to, uh, to put out an out of control fire and have that erupt. It's important to remember how far we've come since March and our ability to manage and contain it. As I said last week, staying home in March and April just didn't uh, flatten the curve and save lives. It also gave us the time to learn more about this brand new virus. Growing our testing and tracing program and supply chains, build our PPE and ventilator stock, and put health and safety procedures in place across all sectors. And we've all learned the small things each of us can and must do to limit the spread including keeping physically separated, washing our hands a lot, wearing masks, and more. The knowledge we've gained and the tools we put in place will help us avoid the drastic actions we had to take in March, allowing us to continue reopening and use tracing and testing to contain outbreaks. And let me be clear, we're going to see new cases and outbreaks will continue to happen. It's the nature of this virus, and we need to remain vigilant until there's a vaccine or other treatment available to everyone. But I know we can do this, and we've already proven just how strong we are, and Vermonters have shown tremendous commitment, and we need to continue, because we know the economic impacts have been severe. And even as we've taken significant steps to restart our economy, with over 40,000 Vermonters still out of work, there's still so much more to do. So I thank all of you for what you've done over the last three months, and I ask you that you don't let up now and that you keep looking out for each other. That can mean checking in on friends and family who still may be home uh, to stay safe, shopping at your local stores, going to or ordering from nearby restaurants, or exploring Vermont with a staycation at one of the hundreds of great lodging facilities in all parts of, of the state. You'll be amazed at what you might find right in our own backyard. It also means giving each other the benefit of the doubt and believing the best in others. In many other regions across the country, the response to this virus has become polarized. So as we've done in so many other ways, let's set the example in Vermont. Continue to get through this by coming together, not pulling apart, and save our energy to fight against our common enemy, COVID-19. Because Vermont is strongest when we pull together, with neighbors helping neighbors and uniting around common goals for the greater good. So I thank you. I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health, date, health uh, update at this point. And I hope that all of you who are either watching or tuned in are doing that in air-conditioned comfort and being extra vigilant on these very, very hot, humid days. My message today simply is that though the sun is shining, the weather is hot, it's summer vacation season, the state and the country are actively engaged in reopening the economy and life as we once knew it, the novel coronavirus has failed to take notice of any of that. It is here and it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Now to be fair, the Northeast, with declining rates of growth of viral infection, is having a better time than the entire southern half and west coast of the country. 
But as this week began, there were 90 or so countries and half of our states that were reporting increased cases and spikes. In fact, the world increase in one day reported by the WHO was 183,000 cases, which is the largest ever. And 12 states reported new records for numbers of cases in a single day. Interestingly, the demographic with the largest number of new cases is ages 18 to 44. Many attribute this to Memorial Day and to other large mass gatherings, though not amazingly to many of the demonstrations and protests that have been occurring around the country and state. The protests that I've seen both within and outside of Vermont have shown that protesters have great willingness to comply with public health guidance and prevent viral transmission from person to person. But overall, the explanation for why the states with the largest spikes are having them is widely acclaimed to be a breakdown in the willingness of the public to adhere to the simple precepts of avoiding mass gatherings, hence an inability to physically distance, and to wear facial coverings. Quite a few weeks ago now, I spoke of what our new normal was going to be the state of affairs that would exist between now and when we have a vaccine or an easy to administer vaccine antiviral treatment. I spoke of a time when we would need to continue to live in a state and country and world where there remained four rules of thumb for daily living, no matter how sick of these we got. Stay home if ill. Wash your hands like crazy, physically distance, and wear facial coverings. Well, that is where we are. The only difference is the difference in compliance when you've been ordered to stay home versus when the state is reopened. So that is the message I'm here to once again deliver. Our lives are getting better every day as we restart Vermont though I know many are still suffering economically and spiritually. But we can't lose track of the fact that the virus hasn't gone anywhere. And we need to continue to be vigilant, cautious, and protective of the most vulnerable in our society and in our own families. With no current hospitalizations and no major growth in our deaths, we are showing what our state and its citizens are truly capable of, but we can't let up. And in public health, as we've said many times here, we expect we will see outbreaks. So our new normal is to quickly respond to new cases or small clusters and prevent them from ever turning into widespread community transmission of virus. Today, our state numbers are 1,163 cases, 926 recovered, 56 deaths. The, the Winooski-Burlington outbreak numbers have increased only ever so slightly, with a total case count of 110. Median age continues to be young at 24, 65% adults, 35% children, and only 30% reporting symptomatic illness. A cumulative total of 126 contacts have been associated with the outbreak. 19 contacts have gone on to become cases. We are also involved in several small investigations throughout the state, in Rutland County and Wyndham County predominantly, and have set up pop-up test sites to accommodate local needs. We've also been able to demonstrate the wisdom of our very aggressive protocol surrounding new admissions to facilities where vulnerable populations are housed. We began this in long-term care facilities where it continues uh, to function. We expanded it to correctional facilities. And over the weekend, we had weekend testing that 
allowed our correctional facilities and psychiatric institutions to be further aware and protected regarding their vulnerability when someone new is admitted to the facility. Those are my comments, and I'll just introduce Secretary Smith to pick up on a few of those themes. Thank you, Dr. Levine. As uh, Dr. Levine said, uh, the Agency of Human Services has six departments, one of them being health and the other, another one being the Department of Corrections. I wanted to give you an update on the Department of Corrections. There's been some new updates that I want you to be aware of. A new uh, positive uh, test came in from an inmate. Uh, was detected at the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility on Saturday. This again was a new intake and as Dr. Levine had mentioned and as I had mentioned on Friday, our um, vulnerability is on when people are entering our facilities and making sure. That's why we're testing upon entry into the facilities. Uh, contact tracing is underway at that facility. The Department of Health and Corrections are coordinating on a mass testing of the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility. The inmate did have contact with staff and, and some other inmates, but not the general population. To give you an update on Marble Valley in Rutland, the Marble Valley Regional Correctional Facility in, in Rutland was tested over the weekend. All staff and inmates, other than the one that traveled from Florida that we talked about last week, all in, staff and inmates at Marble Valley were tested on Saturday. All tests came back negative. Uh, staff and inmates will be tested again uh, today. Uh, today? No, next week, the 29th, Monday the 29th. Uh, this will follow the enhanced procedures that uh, and protocols that uh, Dr. Levine talked about. We'll be doing multiple testing uh, of these facilities uh, when we find a positive, uh, like we did in both Marvel Valley Regional Correctional Facility and the Chittenden uh, Regional Correctional Facility. Um, <clears throat> just to give you an update, I mentioned it last week on Friday that we are restarting the investigation into corrections, the independent investigation into corrections that we began last February. Uh, that was suspended for the health and welfare of the inmate population during the COVID-19 response. I expect that that investigation will be up and running within the next uh, 14 days. Uh, and we'll use all protocols, testing protocols, to make sure that the inmates are safe with visitation of the various investigators. That's the update on, uh, on corrections. Thank you. And with that, we'll open up to questions. Calvin? Uh, thank you. So, Governor, on Friday, the Vermont House passed a $120 million in economic stimulus, um, including there's some, I just kind of want to get your thoughts on that, and also there's uh, some $20 million for um, hazard pay as well, which I know you originally had some concerns about, just to gather your thoughts on those. Yeah, the, uh, the concerns, first of all, the concerns with hazard pay was whether they would be uh, able to be utilized uh, through the guidelines that the, the Treasury has, has outlined. So that's still the case. Just want to make sure that we're able to uh, to administer that, and uh, without the clawback and asking for them to return uh, the, the treasury to return the money. Um, as well, they're moving in the right direction. Uh, obviously, it's just the house. We have to make sure that we understand when we see the headlines that the uh, the house passed something that's only halfway. Uh, need the Senate to to come in and uh, put their thoughts in place as well. Um, I'm still a little concerned uh, about the capacity. Uh, the package we put forth uh, was simple, uh, broad, uh, and tried to, to put the money out as quickly as possible into the hands of those who need it desperately. Um, they're still uh, short if you take the whole, uh, whole amount of money in an aggregate. Uh, they're still short uh, money that we had proposed. Uh, and uh, they put in some, some guidelines that uh, make it a little more complicated, so I'm concerned about that as well. Uh, but again, moving in the right direction, we'll see what the Senate does at this point. 
And then uh, my next question is just for um, Commissioner Harrington. If he's on. He's not on the phone, on the line today. Um, but if you. Uh, Maybe pose the question. We can get the answers for you if, if we don't know them or I don't know them. Okay, I can just follow up with the okay. um, afterwards. But I guess just the last follow-up question then. So, um, Dr. Levine mentioned investigations in both Wyndham and Rutland County. I guess what, what are you investigating uh, at this point? So anytime there's a positive test result, that's an immediate connection with someone and an investigation is launched. So um, we're investigating uh, uh, one work site in Rutland County and one residential community in Wyndham County. And what kind of residential Congregate housing or what? Um, I really don't have details on that, to be honest. Ross? This might be for either the governor or Dr. Levine. Just curious, but a lot of ski areas and other recreational places are starting to open up for their summertime activities, whether that's mountain bike rentals or gondola rides, things like that. Curious if any specific guidelines have been provided with those types of recreational businesses, especially since they have to cut their season short back in March for the ski season, um, you know, to help them get moving faster and make sure that those big tractions are doing so safely. Yeah, some of the uh, the same measures, the basic measures that we've talked about uh, uh, a lot, uh, you know, just making personal hygiene, uh, washing your hands a lot, keeping physically separated uh, is important, a mask if you can, if you, and, and avoid congregate settings. Um, I think Secretary Curley uh, might be on the phone as well. She might be able to elaborate on some of the conditions with the, the recreation uh, aspect. Secretary Curley? Yes, Governor, I'm on. I could tell there's a question about the operations for summer. Yeah, operations we, it, it, was, it, was, it was more about the, uh, the ski areas and uh, the uh, regulations put in place specifically for them and in anticipation of them uh, ramping up for the, for the winter season as well and what this could mean. Is that, is that yes. right? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So we have guidance on our website and uh, some of the ski areas are you know, able to o operate currently under the guidance on the website. I would encourage you to go there to check that out. In terms of you know what it will look like for the winter, um, we aren't specifying right now what winter would look like. Rather, we're trying to get everybody open. Um, obviously, we said that it's going to be a long time before we look like we did when we completely shut down, but um, we're working for that. And uh, if you want to talk more broadly on that, uh, feel free to take it offline. But again, there's, there's guidance on our website and um, outdoor recreation and areas certainly can be you know operating now as long as they follow all the guidelines it's really about the the how you know we want to open up every sector and it's just about how you do that and and how you keep people safe uh, all right we can go over to the phones uh, mike donahue the islander Uh, this is for Governor Commissioner Sterling. The uh, free food distribution program during COVID-19 is an important program, but like any government program, there's waste and fraud. <clears throat> it appears some people got free food and turned around and tried to sell it to make money. A reader from Burlington shared a screenshot with me with one person showing the food she was trying to sell. Another person on Facebook called her out and she claimed she had no place to store the food. And somebody suggested donating it to the food shelf. I'm wondering what the state is seeing in the way of fraud or food getting into the wrong hands in this important program. Yeah, Mike, I had not seen that. And, uh, you know, that's really unfortunate. This is a, a program that uh, many Vermonters need. And that's why we want to make sure that we put it in the hands of those who, who need it uh, the most. Um, I'm going to let Secretary Smith uh, talk a little bit about the food program because we've been, you know, trying to highlight that uh, where we saw the, the lines uh, that, uh, that had evolved uh, when we, we opened those, uh, those uh, uh, distribution sites up. 
and uh, were concerned about the people who weren't there, uh, those who didn't have vehicles and so forth. So, uh, Secretary Smith, do you want to elaborate? Sure, Governor, and thank you very much, uh, Mike, for the question. Obviously, we'll look into anybody that is committing fraud in these food distribution, um, this food distribution program. This is a great program. Um, for the farm to family program that you've been seeing is a great uh, program. I do have a, a few concerns with, with the program. Um, from my perspective, there's four solid reasons to find a better way to distribute food than the current system. First, there is the public safety aspect of this. Uh, people waiting hours in cars, especially those with small children and older Vermonters on hot days like today in the summer is just not safe. Uh, second, people have been frustrated by the long waits, especially when the food runs out or they simply turn around um, discouraged by the lines. And then third, we need to get those, and I've said this from the podium before, we need to get those um, in need uh, onto sustainable programs, uh, food assistance programs, SNAP or three squares as we call it in Vermont. And fourth, we need to give those in need some dignity in how we distribute food to them. So the registration, uh, we put in place just recently a registration program that has three fundamental goals. It makes distribution more effective and efficient without the long wait. Uh, people will not be frustrated or discouraged. In fact, the registration system has not resulted in any uh, recent reductions in participation. It's also safer for the participants, and it allows for the distribution of more sustainable program information. Three squares, for example. Uh, for example, beyond that, just so that all Vermonters know, we'll continue to help with the distribution as appropriate. But we need to get the. Um, the Farm to Family Program, which is, again is a great program by the way, and I thank our partners um, uh, in the Food Distribution Network, Food Shelves in particular, um, back to our normal food distribution channels at the lo local food bank level where there's more predictability and sustainability. Um, we, the state, and the Guard, which you've got to call out the Guard here, they've done an amazing job. Uh, can assist where there are gaps and will continue to assist where there are gaps. But the quicker we can get back into our existing food distribution infrastructure, the better. And maybe eliminate some of the things, Mike, that you're bringing up uh, in your comments. None of this food distribution, and I, I, this is important, none of this food distribution on a statewide level would couldn't have been done without the dedication and coordination of the state and guard in partnership with local food banks and anti-hunger advocates. Our goal of getting food to people in need is, um, is demonstrable and mutual. And what, what's the level of fraud you're seeing? What's that? What is the level of fraud you're seeing? We, we have not been aware of any fraud at the moment, but we certainly will look in based upon what you have, uh, what you have raised. Okay, and one, one follow-up for the governor from Friday. Uh, we had asked you about uh, police accountability. There was another uh, misconduct case over the weekend that went public. Uh, involving a Vermont State Police Lieutenant. I'm wondering as governor, what your personal belief is as to whether it's overdue for bad behaving troopers to be treated like municipal police, county sheriffs, have discipline more open and not hidden behind doors like SPAC has uh, for 40 years. Well, again, you know, we need to be more transparent uh, to give the, the general public, our constituents, uh, faith in the process. Uh, so we'll see where that all goes. I know we, um, Commissioner Sherling, had laid out uh, different proposals to the legislature for consideration, uh, and uh, body cameras was one of those considerations that we think we, we should move forward on, but we're willing to have the conversation across the board. 
I'm talking more about the actual discipline when somebody does do something bad. Yeah, they, again, uh, yeah, willing to have the, the conversation, and I believe we're going to have uh, more conversation. It won't be just in this legislative session, but I would suspect uh, ongoing uh, even in the next legislative session. But you personally favor more transparency than what's been going on for uh, the last few yeah, years? I, I'm not going to comment on what's been going on. I just believe... Uh, basically and fundamentally in more transparency. I think that we need more faith and trust in government and, and you do that by being transparent. Thank you very much, Doug. Appreciate it, Mike. <clears throat> Avery, WCAX. Governor Todd, can you give us any indication about what big terms we might be expecting Wednesday or Friday? Um, we'll see a little bit more. You know, I want to get up, uh, as you have seen, uh, we've gotten up to 50% uh, capacity in many areas, and we'll watch the data, watch uh, uh, the number of cases uh, continue to, to come in, possibly this week, uh, to make a final determination. But I want to get us all to a 50% level um, by, uh, by, by July 1. So I think you could expect if things uh, continue to move uh, similar uh, to what we've seen over the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, that we could uh, we could open up um, um, most sectors to 50 percent. Okay, thank you. Andrew, Caledonia Record. Yes, good morning. Uh, thanks again for taking all these questions. Uh, this is for Dr. Levine. Uh, I'm curious about the status of community transmission versus known exposure in recent weeks. I know the Northeast Kingdom has seen only about seven cases in the last three weeks and none reported in Essex County in over a month. Um, while the risk always exists, can you determine if certain regions are actually experiencing community transmission or not? Sure, thanks for that. Um, community transmission to our uh, best analysis right now is, is not a major factor and what's going on in Vermont. Um, even when we look at um, our largest outbreak, uh, the majority of what we're seeing is uh, within households, within a community, and um, easily traceable contacts uh, within the network as opposed to uh, widespread uh, transmission of illness across uh, each, each of the communities involved. Uh, similarly, um, you know, you heard earlier today about a case here and there in the correctional facility. Um, we're not having uh, anything more than that in those facilities. We're not having anything widespread in long-term care facilities. And the couple of new uh, clusters that I've mentioned really are, um, I would call them confined in a very small way as opposed to uh, lots of activity around. I think in support of all of that is the fact that when you look at our number of daily new incident cases, most days that remains very small and single digit numbers. When you look at the percent of our tests that are positive on a given day, that continues to be well below 2% and often below 1%. So we would see some of those concerning indicators really starting to move in the right and the wrong direction if uh, there was community transmission occurring. So we're pretty comfortable with that now, but again, we have our guard up all the time, and that's why I'd like Vermonters to also have their guard up all the time and make sure that um, these phenomena of hand washing and physical distancing and facial coverings don't just drift away. Um, because they really are the reason for this success. Thank you for that. Um, as a follow-up, you, you were starting to, to touch on it. Um, what advice would you give to people that are allowing fear of the virus to interrupt plans that might otherwise be allowed by the state's guidelines? Um, do, do you see a point where um, you know, a healthy caution develops into something that is excessive? Yeah, so I, I, I like fear to be appropriate fear, 
and not inappropriate fear. So when I've talked about those who are, you know, uh, of older age or um, have some chronic conditions, we are not telling them to do nothing. And I've tried to emphasize that very, very clearly. Um, but to be very measured in their approach and to choose wisely not to choose something that might put them at higher risk because of the size of a gathering or their inability to really physically distance in that setting, but to choose something that they'd be able to have more control over themselves, but still be out and about and doing things that they enjoy to do in Vermont. So I'm not hearing that fear is playing a tremendous role in our population right now. Um, and so I wouldn't want people to get overly carried away because I've said the virus is still there and you're going to encounter it. Uh, the reality is the virus is still there, but you don't have to encounter it if you try to play your cards just right and do all the things you want to do in a controlled way that I've sort of uh, emphasized. Um, and, you know, the state has opened up a lot. Um, but certainly, when you compare our reopening uh, to many, many other places, it's been very, very measured and done in a very phased way and looking at data. And people can feel comfortable that if we're making a move, it's because we've looked at the data from the previous weeks and really haven't seen a reason for concern or a reason to interrupt the progression of what's going on and what's getting restarted. So, they should take comfort in that, that we're being very um, compulsive, if you will, about the process that we're using. So that their fear would not be well-founded if that was why they were concerned. Okay. Thank you very much. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Following up from what uh, Dr. Levine just mentioned about opening up in a methodical way, States that have, are opening up more rapidly are seeing uh, spikes in new cases. And even though they're pretty far away, you know, we've seen that inmate from Florida come here, bring the virus with them. Would there come a point where even if the region were doing well, we'd have to put the brakes on in reopening the Vermont economy because of um, what's happening even, even farther away in the U.S.? Um, Tim, we certainly hope that's not the case, but um, as we've, you've seen in the past, we'll do what we can to prevent, uh, protect Vermonters. Um, we've, um, we've been doing this slowly, methodically, measured, um, and opening up the region. I think you'll see more of that. Uh, we're seeing some, some good news in some of those hot spots like uh, New York City, uh, New York in general, uh, as well as in Massachusetts. Uh, New Jersey and uh, Rhode Island, so we're, Connecticut as well. So we're seeing some 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 good news, and uh, um, so in the future uh, we'll continue to expand uh, the Northeast, uh, possibly to other states as well, uh, so that we can enjoy uh, some um, more tourism and guests uh, here in the state uh, to get back on track to where we we should be. So. Uh, we'll see what happens with the other states where you're flying in, um, but certainly at this point in time, those in a drivable distance uh, to Vermont, we want to encourage in any way we can uh, to take advantage of our beautiful state. Uh, and Governor, could you comment on the racial incident at Talladega last night? I know that, that NASCAR is something you follow quite closely, and it's um, been a, a very big news story today. Yeah. Yeah, really uh, disturbing uh, and concerning. Um, but I will say this, um, NASCAR uh, has been a leader on this front. Uh, Bubba Wallace with the 43 car, uh, who, uh, who's been also an advocate for uh, not allowing the Confederate flag on the, on the premises of any NASCAR event and was successful in doing that. NASCAR followed suit. Um, they will get to the bottom of this. Uh, this was a very uh, close uh, contact area. Uh, not many uh, people were allowed into this garage area, uh, so they, they know who they are. And, um, and I have no doubt uh, that they are working feverishly uh, to put an end to this. It does highlight the fact that um, just by, by 
uh, this regulation uh, doesn't mean the policy, uh, the uh, uh, the situation uh, goes away. Um, we have so much more work to do collectively as a country uh, to make sure that we uh, again put put a stop uh, to this racial inequity. Uh, and we listen to one another, and we listen to the uh, the black community in particular. Um, so uh, the good news is they're taking this seriously. Uh, they'll get to the bottom of it. Uh, of course, the concerning news is that it happened at all, and uh, but it shows just how far well, we have to go uh, to put an end to this. All right, great. Thank you very much. Greg, the County Courier. Hi, Governor. Um, I'd like to start by asking for an update on USCIS uh, layoffs or furloughs um, and any other government sector furloughs or layoffs. I understand that Customs and Border Protection jobs may be next if they've seen a pretty significant loss in revenue. Yeah, Greg, I, I have not had any further updates from what we gave you, I think, on Friday. Or, or maybe it was Wednesday, but have not heard anything more on that front. Obviously, we're concerned about it as well. I've reached out to the congress congressional delegation as well as to the federal government to uh, to tell us uh, a little bit more, but we have not heard anything back to my knowledge. Okay, thank you. And, uh, and for today's question here, um, beginning on Friday and lasting for most of the weekend, uh, the towns of Montgomery, Enosburg, and Sheldon at least, and maybe some other ones in there, uh, saw a pretty substantial outage by consolidated communications for telephone and internet, uh, which also happened to uh, affect the AT&T towers in the area. Uh, so many people were also without cell phone coverage. Um, spoke to one business who, you know, after struggling to get through the shutdown, wasn't able to even process credit cards over the weekend, so they they were very limited to just cash. Um, your administration has proposed uh, tens of millions of dollars in, in federal CARES money to be spent on high-speed internet. Uh, and you've likened this to the Rural Electrification Act of 1936. Um, of course, if electricity only worked a few hours a day and you never knew what hours it was, we wouldn't really rely on electricity as they could do today. So how is your administration going to uh, make sure that this money is being used to build out infrastructure that's reliable? Yeah, well, first of all, we have to see what the legislature does with our proposal. Uh, obviously, uh, building this out, um, what we're proposing isn't going to go far enough either. Um, we need a uh, congressional act in some respects, a federal action as a result of this. I think we, it highlights the need uh, throughout our country for high speed. Uh, uh, internet, uh, as well as you know, broadband, uh, as well as uh, making sure it's reliable. I think that that's important as well, maybe even more important. Um, so we'll uh, we'll continue to advocate for that. I don't believe I have anyone on from the Public Service Department uh, to comment on the consolidated uh, issue that they had on Friday, um, but I will certainly. Uh, Ask the commissioner and uh, ask her to give you a call uh, for uh, for comment on that. That'd be great. And uh, just one more quick question that I've been hearing the last couple of days from people in the area on this. Uh, two years ago, high speed broadband was a major talking point in the campaign, uh, and pledges were made by Christine Hawkwest to expand broadband throughout the state. Is it fair to say that Vermont would have been more technologically equipped for this pandemic had she been elected in 2018? Um, I, I have no idea. And the money still has to come from somewhere. Um, my, uh, my issue uh, in that respect, I think everyone agreed uh, that uh, we need more high, higher speed, uh, more accessible broadband throughout the state. Uh, but it was a question of where was the money going to come from? Uh, the question is still there. Uh, without federal action, uh, without uh, without spending hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, we won't have it. So we uh, received this CARES money. Uh, we are proposing to use part of that uh, for higher uh, speed, higher capacity, and uh, more widespread uh, broadband. And I think that the legislature feels the same way. But even that money doesn't go far enough. It's just not enough uh, to uh, to satisfy the need. So. 
Um, again, that, that's something that I don't know how we would determine that, uh, but what would we have done without had we uh, spent hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for high-speed broadband over the last two years? And we have moved forward. I mean, our, our Department of Public Service has, uh, has done a lot in this regard uh, with, the, with the, some more of the community um, um, initiatives that we've uh, we put forth. And um, again, uh, utilizing some of the money that we're receiving uh, from the CARES Act would be appropriate, but we need, uh, we need more federal action for this to be significant. Thank you, Governor. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Hello, Governor. Um, given the apparent lack of uh, more uh, COVID cases um, after significant uh, uh, numbers of people out in the streets for the demonstrations. Um, is this information um, going to be factored into decisions about opening um, outdoor events more than have been the case so far? I mean, is this useful information? Yeah, yeah, I, I would, uh, I would say so. I, I've said this uh, from the start. It might tell us uh, something about the spread of the virus. It might tell us something as well about um, the number of uh, protesters that we saw um, exercising their First Amendment rights and uh, and being masked while doing it. Uh, I think that uh, that tells a lot. So, if we can do this safely, uh, we're not trying to punish anyone, uh, but we're utilizing the information we have uh, available to us at this point. We had to, uh, to first reduce the, the congregate settings, uh, the number of people getting together, uh, but it does uh, you know, somewhat tell us uh, a story. And if we can uh, prove that we can have more people, which we've done, uh, actually, we've, we've allowed for more people uh, to, to get together, um, this, this might be um, something we'll learn from this. Dr. Levine, anything uh, you want to add in that regard? He's shaking his head no. So. Up to 150. Up to yeah, yeah, we're up to 150 at this point. Um, but, but again, you know, this might uh, uh, tell the story about how we can open it up further, which is our, our intention is to continue to, to expand in a methodical way. Thank you. Kat, WCAX. We've heard many times of these updates, the phrase, until there's a vaccine available. How confident are we that a vaccine will be effective and how much of our state's planning for the future depends on having one? Well, we're not, uh, you know, we want there to be a vaccine that's developed. Um, how soon that is, I'm not sure that anyone knows. I know there are a lot of different entities working on this and, uh, and I have confidence that uh, they'll come up with something but it has to be effective. Uh, it also has to be widespread uh, so that we can distribute it to a large amount of people. And uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens in the future. In the meantime, uh, what we need to do is deal with reality. Uh, and that's why we've talked all the time about physically distancing ourselves, uh, hygiene, washing your hands a lot, wearing a, fast, a face mask when, uh, when you can. I mean, those types of things, simple things that we're doing are effective. Uh, so we can't, uh, we can't just wait for the virus or for the vaccine uh, to, to be developed. We have to deal with uh, the reality of today. Dr. Levine. You know, in the scientific community, I, you rarely see the kind of optimism uh, that we're seeing about vaccine right now. Um, because a number of the vaccine candidates, as they're called, have already reached phase two and on the verge of phase three trials. And considering the virus has only been here you know, since February, you never see things go that fast and things get advanced to that level of vaccine development uh, that quickly. It's also felt that the sort of spike proteins that are on the coronavirus that you see every time you see a picture of the coronavirus make excellent um, antigens, if you will, for a vaccine to be effective with. So um, though I'm not with the truly um, 
I won't call it fringe end, but the, 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 the community that feels that before Thanksgiving, we're going to be uh, all vaccinated. I think that's a bit overzealous. Uh, I'm certainly in the group of people who feels that we are in an advanced pace of vaccine development. So something that normally might take 18 months or 24 months, maybe we can cut that to 12 months to 18 months, something of that sort. Um, so I would be optimistic about that. With regard to how dependent is the state, you know, it's really not the state, it's the world. How dependent is the world on, on the vaccine development? Because the bottom line is most of the models that are now being looked at for what's going to happen in the future, they talk about the resurgence in the fall and maybe that persisting longer. But a lot more people now are talking about what we're seeing today around the country and around the world is the future. And this is the way it's going to be, kind of just a prolonged bout with the virus, trying to contain it every time we can find uh, the ability to do so when we encounter it. So just using that approach constantly all the time, which again then means all of the things the governor just said and that I've said earlier today about what we have to do ourselves personally in terms of our own responsibility to really uh, continue that because without a vaccine, assuming the viral activity re re remains the way I've just described where it's here and it's not going to be quiet, it's going to have punctuations of noise that we have to try to suppress. Um, that's really determining what we do with the future, whether there's a vaccine or no vaccine. It's, it's not the vaccine possibility sort of guiding us. It's just the fact that this is how we have to contend with the virus. So to follow up then, given the back and forth that we've seen with serology testing and some of the concerns about the accuracy of rapidly developed medical technology, what do we need to see in a vaccine before the state would endorse it as something Vermonters should get on a large scale. Yeah, so um, clearly um, when a vaccine becomes available, we have to, number one, believe that it has the efficacy, the benefits that it's touted to have, so that it's been through the appropriate trials and shown how protective it is so that we don't falsely reassure people, you get the vaccine and you're invincible, get out there without a mask and live your life. Uh, we wanna know for sure that it works in a large percentage of people. Equally important is the safety aspect. And that's why the earliest vaccine trials are, are not actually directed to how effective it is as much as, is it gonna hurt anybody in a big way? Um, so we need to know that for sure because like any medication, a uh, vaccine, not, not that it's a traditional medication, there's always that potential for it to have harm, even though with most of the vaccines we use nowadays, that's a very, very minor percentage of what happens. And then lastly, we want to know it's been studied on a large enough population that some of those more unusual side effects would have come out then. Because when anything new comes on the marketplace, that's medical and that's a treatment. Um, it's studied in a limited number of people and we hope that what we find in those studies we can extrapolate to the general population. But we'd really need to know that it had been studied in a large enough population that it would be safe for the population at large to benefit from and that segments of that population it would benefit. So not just middle-aged males or college-aged males who tend to be enrolled in trials uh, of medication, but women, but children, the elderly, and the list goes on. We want to make sure that uh, each of those populations has had a sample in the uh, bigger trials so that we know that it's safe and effective in those. Um, and then lastly, to finally answer the end of your question, you need to have the capacity to be able to deliver the vaccine to the population. That's one thing to um, say we've got something that works and then you don't have the needles, you don't have the syringes, you don't have the supply of vaccine, you don't have the uh, refrigeration capabilities, all of that. So that's why we've stood up an entire uh, working group already 
with this in mind for the future so that all of these, uh, I'll call them logistic, but they're much more than logistic considerations can be taken care of because we don't want this to turn out like PPE turned out in March for the country or testing turned out in March for the country. If there's a vaccine and it works, we want people to benefit from it. And by the way, we want Vermont to get as much of it as it can early on uh, and make sure that we get it because we've demonstrated we have the capacity to deliver it to the whole population in a methodical way that we've thought out already and planned for. So does that mean Vermont is already like acquiring supplies like those needles, or uh, refrigeration technology, syringes, things like that? Or is the working group working on like where would those come from still? Yeah, the working group is really developing their entire process task list uh, supply needs, everything. Um, we figure this is way early enough. Uh, we're here in June, and if we have this together in a couple of weeks, we'll really know what we need to be accessing. Just like with uh, PPE, you know, where everybody's hypothesizing about a need in the fall, well, we've been planning for the fall for, for a while now, and we're, we're still planning for the future in terms of making sure we have more than enough, not less. Thank you. Chris Mays, Brattleboro Reformer. Hi, uh, good afternoon. I was wondering if um, if you can say what, um, what factors define a cluster and, um, and trigger a pop-up testing site. That's what we mean. Sure. Um, so obviously, you don't know anything until you have one case. So that presumes that either clinically someone's determined someone has COVID or through a test site for whatever reason, the person was symptomatic, not symptomatic, or needed to get a test for another purpose, whatever, but they've turned positive. Um, or maybe they and other members of their family have turned positive, or other members of their um, work site, what have you. Uh, so you quickly assess uh, exactly what are the characteristics of the couple of positives you've seen, and then that's when the work of uh, interviewing and what we call contact tracing occurs. It's easy enough to connect with the first couple of people give them instructions as to isolation and what they need to do and how to uh, work with their health care providers, medically speaking. But then it's really a matter of determining what the risk level is for those who surround those people. So um, if we're going to call something a cluster, it generally means there's a couple of uh, index cases, if you will, and we feel that there's sufficient risk that uh, a pop-up site would be appropriate so that those who were at risk uh, don't have to jump through a lot of hoops to get tested. It's made very easy for them, um, bringing the testing to the, to the door, so to speak. So it makes it much easier to uh, early on identify who's at risk, who may actually uh, have contracted the virus, and uh, who uh, is just at risk but would be at high risk of developing illness and then giving it to others so that we can manage the, the, their uh, isolation appropriately. So when a pop-up site is set up, it's because we have a concern about the greater community. It doesn't mean we know something special and we expect hundreds of people to be infected. It just means we want to make sure we can work in a very expeditious fashion, fashion to help people understand their own risk, help them get tested, and identify anybody who uh, might need to be uh, isolated. All right, and I was wondering if more information will be made public about what inspired the sites in, in Butlin County and, and Wyndham County. Yeah, so obviously these are, these are very early, um, and you know, in epidemiology, everyone has got accustomed to us um, 
characterizing cases and what's going on on the ground, so to speak. But every time we do that, it means we've done investigation. So epidemiology, a big portion of it is detective work. And like a good detective in the public safety sector, you don't talk about things that you don't know anything about yet uh, or, or that might actually mislead people. So just because we know of a few cases, we don't know the whole story. So if we're not releasing a lot of information in the first day or two, it's because we actually want to know what we're talking about, have accurate information, have characterized the nature of that cluster or outbreak or whatever we're calling it at the time, and don't want to mislead people with false information. Um, so that's where we're at at this point. Thank you. Colin, VT Digger. Yeah, hi, thank you all for your time. Uh, I had some follow-up questions about the case in Chittenden Regional. I guess those are probably best directed at Secretary Smith. So I was wondering, um, when the case was identified first? Thanks, Colin. The case was identified on Saturday. And this was part of the normal routine of checking inmates into the prison, basically? That's, that's, what, it, that's what happened. The test result of an intake uh, revealed this uh, positive. My understanding of the policies is that inmates wouldn't be sort of contacting other inmates until this test had been conducted, or did this contact happen before the test? The, the contact happened, they did have contact with staff and some other inmates. That is, they didn't have contact with the general population. We're trying to figure that out right now. Colin, could you repeat the question? You mean you're trying to determine how they came into contact with other inmates? Yes. Am I okay? Uh, Colin, I think you might either you, I don't know if you're done or you're just breaking up, but we can't hear you here. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. The prisoner also entered on Saturday, is that right? I don't have the information on the entry. I know that um, it was detected, and I'll get that, I'll follow up that information when the entry ha actually happened, but it was detected at the facility on Saturday. That's the information I have right now. Gotcha. Uh, and lastly, the inmates who came into contact with this person are being isolated now? I believe that's the case right now. But uh, Colin, I will, I will double check on that as well. They're certainly being tested. Um, and then just one question for Governor Scott, um, sort of following up on something from last week. You mentioned you might follow up with your people about um, having press conferences again that don't necessarily focus on COVID-19. Um, I was wondering if you've had a chance to explore that any further. Yeah, haven't, uh, haven't looked into that more. I, I think we have broadened uh, some of the scope of of these, I mean, we're not talking about just COVID cases uh, today or on uh, Friday or last Wednesday. So uh, they have broadened, but uh, we're, we're taking it under advisement as to whether we reduce the number um, per week. for whoever would like to answer it. Uh, I'm here in Brattleboro. Uh, I saw the pop-up testing uh, on Sunday and then drove about 10 
miles north on Route 30 to a very popular swimming hole where I counted about 100 out-of-state calls or out-of-state cars and trucks. Uh, none of those people were wearing masks. And likewise, when I was interviewing people in terms of did they understand Vermont's quarantine uh, guidelines or Vermont's travel guidelines, pretty much they all said no. Or they felt that because it was just a day trip uh, across the border that they didn't count. I guess I'm sort of, are you hearing similar stories in terms of issues with swimming holes during this heat wave? And likewise, is, is there a reaction or response to that kind of a story? Yeah, it, you know, Kevin, we did, uh, I did see some stories uh, revolving around Lake Champlain and, and some other uh, opportunities where people were getting out uh, this weekend and not wearing masks. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes the masks and water don't uh, don't go hand in hand, and uh, so that's been uh, problematic. Uh, but it is concerning the trend uh, that we're, we're seeing in some areas. Uh, some are, are very uh, proactive, uh, wearing masks, and other areas uh, not as much. Um, I would, uh, in terms of the quarantine, I, you might, might be able to tell me this, but uh, most of uh, of New Hampshire and Maine and part of uh, Massachusetts and a good good share of New York uh, have qualified in terms of our 400 cases, active cases uh, per million um, threshold. So we have opened up uh, to some of those bordering and, and bordering communities, bordering counties uh, around uh, Vermont. So maybe, maybe you could, if you know, um, were they outside of those uh, those counties? They were uh, a lot from Boston, New York City, Connecticut. Um, you know, when we looked at the map, they were definitely in either yellow or red zones. And again, partly they just didn't know of the under, you know, they had not been on the state website, had not seen anything in terms of the news. Um, but then in some cases, the feeling was, well, I'm just here for the afternoon, so yeah. I don't qualify for that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's difficult uh, to get the message out to everyone. And uh, we put up signage along our roadways and so forth about quarantines and, and to uh, check before you come to Vermont. And, and it's, it's clear the other way uh, as well. Uh, New Hampshire, uh, Maine, uh, as well as Massachusetts and so forth have those requirements uh, throughout the Northeast. All, uh, it seems like all states have some sort of quarantine requirement uh, that people just aren't aware of. So it's a communication problem. I don't have the answer. We're doing the best we can in getting that out. And I know uh, you are as well in the media trying to get that message out, but it's hard to hit everyone. Uh, and it's, it's been, again, uh, one of those frustrating areas where if people just uh, are willing but don't know, um, just aren't looking far enough. Thank you. Aaron, VT Digger. Uh, some of our readers have been asking uh, when municipal playgrounds will reopen. I was wondering if you had any thought or have any plans related to that. Um, you know, we were just talking about that this this morning, uh, and uh, I will look into that. Um, certainly, the playgrounds are somewhat problematic uh, because there's a lot of. Uh, uh, hygiene uh, issues, uh, kids touching everything, uh, and so that that's uh, that's been a concern of ours. But I really I don't have the answer to that. But I'd be uh, be willing to uh, to take a look and uh, bring that up with a group. Is there any discussion of you know what measures you could take to kind of mitigate the um, sanitary issues? Um, you know, I, I, I just don't know at this point in time until we have the conversation. I know why we closed them. Um, and, uh, and as you might imagine, it would be difficult for uh, someone to be wiping down all of the, the slides and, and, uh, and, and so forth uh, that, uh, that we have, all the touch points we have in a recreational type of out, um, facility, especially with kids. Uh, so uh, we're we're going to have the conversation. I just don't have the answer for you at this point in time. All right. Colin, Colin, seven days. Hi, 
Governor. This question is for you. I was wondering, um, Mr. Chair, do you have any thoughts about the legislature not taking up any of the prison reforms that um, Secretary Smith had recommended, including one specifically that would bar all DOC workers from any sexual relations with those in the system? Um, I may let uh, Secretary Smith uh, cover part of that, but uh, just as a reminder, uh, I'm not sure that uh, you know the session's not over. Um, obviously, they're going into recess. Uh, there's other opportunities when they come back in August. But uh, Secretary Smith, sure, Colin. As uh, as you know, I was hopeful that they would take these up. I'm still hopeful that at some point they would take these up. I can understand, given the uh, circumstances with COVID-19 and some of the distraction away from there. My hope is that we will continue to do this. I think it's imperative that we do some of the things that I had outlined in that memo. Um, it seems years ago now, but uh, I think it was in, when I first got here around November or December, uh, I think this was the first issue that uh, I dealt with. So I'm hopeful that they will start taking up uh, some of these issues, particularly around um, behavior, uh, also recruiting, and uh, some other areas that we had recommended uh, for our reform package for um, correctional officers. Great, and then just a follow-up for you, Governor, um, on an unrelated topic. I was just wondering if you could share your thoughts about the pushback in the House Juneteenth vote on Friday um, and whether you would have voted for the resolution if you were uh, still in the legislature. Yeah, um, from my standpoint, I, I probably would have uh, continued to vote in favor of it. I, I did uh, thought, I thought it was unfortunate uh, that when the uh, Republicans had, had said if you just would remove uh, the the mention of President Trump, uh, that they could have gotten behind it and maybe had a 100 percent of the, of the House voting in favor of that resolution. It was just a moment in time when you could unite around, uh, you know, a common cause and uh, sent a, a message. Um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, that did not happen. They did. Uh, they weren't uh, able to or weren't successful in having that removed, uh, the mention of uh, President Trump. Um, but again, from my standpoint, I, I would have voted for it, uh, but I but I understand uh, that it came down to, to politics and it's unfortunate because, again, just removal of that section would have uh, would have uh, sent a powerful message. I think that we're all in this together. We believe in the, in the, in the message of of uh, of, uh, of really uh, thinking about uh, um, how powerful uh, Juneteenth was and is and, and how we should recognize it more in the future. So uh, I just thought it was unfortunate. Well, just to push back on that a little bit, I mean, do you think that politics can be removed from this conversation? You've talked at length um, about some of these issues in the recent weeks, and you've obviously made your distaste with some of the president's comments clear. I mean, it, it, I mean, is that a realistic request to expect that politics will not play into um, the discussion right now? Well, I think you could have a separate uh, resolution on the president uh, if it came down to, you know, whether you pass uh, the 90 percent of a resolution with 100 percent behind you. I think, again, that's a powerful statement. You know, President Trump uh, is just a, a snapshot in time in some respects. Uh, this is, uh, he, he may not be uh, with us uh, after November. Who knows what's going to happen in this next election? But Juneteenth uh, is going to be with us uh, throughout eternity. And, and it's, it's about, again, reflecting on the significance of that date and what it meant uh, to Americans, what it meant to our country. And we should reflect on that and work on that and make sure uh, that we realize how, again, how significant that was and how much more work we have to do in order to, uh, to get to a place uh, that we, we want to be. So again, from my standpoint, uh, I would have, uh, have, had I been a leader in, in the body, I would have taken that out, uh, had the vote, and then developed another resolution on the, on the rest of it. Uh, so that you could have at least uh, sent the message uh, so that we're united in this cause uh, to, for, for the common good. 
Thank you. Lisa, the AP. Lisa, AP. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, the legislature wants to wrap up this week and they're planning to allocate about a, mil a billion dollars from the CARES Act and then save about $250 million. Um, and they're planning to pass a first quarter budget and then come back in August, I think when they know more about sort of the state's fiscal health and what money uh, will be available to help um, state and local governments cope. Um, and I'm just wondering, Governor, what do you think of what they're doing? Well, again, you know, uh, we're trying to to figure out exactly uh, what's in the economic package, what we put forward, uh, what they're covering. It still appears that there's, there's a significant amount that's uh, that's not included. Uh, it's been become a little bit more complicated from uh, from the House uh, perspective. It still has to go through the Senate. There's still a lot of work to do uh, through this week, um, and and I uh, I understand the need to to wrap things up. Uh, and get moving. I just uh, I'm not sure if they can get it all go all done uh, in this week, but uh, but but it, they may, and uh, and then come back in in August. I think that makes sense. We'll know more about uh, what uh, what our fiscal health is, uh, and uh, have a you know uh, maybe a little bit more um, uh, recognition of uh, of how things are playing out in terms of the. Uh, coronavirus uh, and their economy as well. I, again, I think they will have to come back. Uh, quarter one budget. Uh, again, we would uh, we had included a two percent reduction in the first quarter, uh, so that because we know that there's going to be a, a deficit, uh, they upped that uh, to uh, allow us to spend up to the the full 25 percent uh, of the 100 percent of the quarter of last year. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. Uh, but again. Uh, I believe, uh, regardless, there's going to be a deficit when we get back in August. Okay. Would it make sense to you to come back in August? I think, yeah, I don't see any other way around that. I think it's uh, a good plan uh, to go and have a, a, a one quarter of the budget done, uh, and then we'll have a, a better idea of, uh, of where we are in reality. Okay. And then I have a question for Dr. Levine. Um, we had you know, a couple of weeks there where we had uh, new cases that were in the single digits, and then I noticed just in the last few days, we, or since Friday, or you know, maybe the last few days, we've had, you know, 10 or 12 new cases every day. Um, and I was just wondering, do you know what's going on there? I know you said that uh, community transmission doesn't seem to be a big deal in Vermont, but is that what's happening in, in, with those numbers? Yeah, so, um, on one day over the weekend, we had 12 cases. Yesterday, four cases. The day before, the 12 cases was four cases, I believe. So certainly not a trend. Um, I didn't bring my, my slide with me today to, to show you the uh, new cases, but it's been up and down in a low range still, not, but not as low as it was prior to the uh, Winooski burlington outbreak, um, but still, you know, we have to be careful how we use the term community transmission. I mean, obviously, these are cases arising in a community. Um, so that's fine, but they're not necessarily spreading throughout that community. Um, and they're kind of what we expect. Like you said, we, we expect if we continue to test at this capacity, we will find cases. And um, if we continue to have people uh, doing what we're actually allowing them to do, which is re-engage and um, that together with other people, uh, we will find cases. But we're not alarmed by the total numbers per day that we've been seeing um, in the, certainly in the last week or 10 days for sure. Okay, thank you. Great, I'm gonna go back to Guy Pierce and then Dr. Levine. Hello, Governor. Yesterday, a parent of young children asked me to ask you, quote, why our playgrounds are still cut up with more wire than an East German border crossing? 
while some municipal and school playgrounds are open on a play at your own risk, many are simply closed. I understand school, play, school playgrounds will be open with restrictions this fall, but on behalf of the one in eight Vermonters, nine years old or under, and their parents and child care workers, can you say when all public playgrounds will be open this summer? Yeah, I, uh, Guy, I don't know if you heard my answer uh, before. Someone else asked the same question about uh, when those would be it. open up. Um, I, we're, we were talking about this morning, and, and I wasn't, uh, to be honest with you, I wasn't quite sure whether they were open or not. Um, so we'll have the discussion. Obviously, the, the touch points, uh, multiple touch points in a, in a um, uh, playground are significant uh, for a lot of kids. A lot of touch points, hard to clean, and so forth. So. But we'll have the conversation because uh, I think, uh, especially during the summer, uh, we need to, to make sure there is activities for our kids. Thank you. All right, Liam, VPR. Hi, uh, Commissioner Levine. Um, last week, you talked a little bit about how you were waiting for more information on the, in the Burling community's the outbreak to sort of be able to define whether it was boxed in, contained, sort of like what stage we are at. Um, do, you, do you have a better sense now of, of what stage that situation is at? Uh, sure. Um, it's, I, it's so common to use the forest fire analogies these days. Um, so I would use the term smoldering. Um, it's not completely over. We know that we haven't even gone through that additional 14-day uh, cycle that we wanted to go through. But um, the most recent cases that have been added to the list to get to the 110, some of them are true new cases. A number of them are contacts that converted to cases. And a number of them were cases that we already knew about in the community and had already been tallied up as a case in in Vermont, but we hadn't attributed it to the outbreak itself. So um, I, I'm still, you know, obviously we're doing what we can to contain it, and we're doing a great job actually, but the bottom line is to say that it's fully contained, it's not quite there yet. So I'm going to have to hedge with you again um, and just say that. Um, until we really don't have anything new associated with it, it's not 100% over. But clearly, we've received incredible compliance by all who have been affected by this, and uh, there's every indication it's going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, and back to uh, the following up on a question that was asked earlier about these new uh, clusters, or, or I guess you're trying to define what they are in Wyndham County and Rutland County. Um, you know, can you give some specific details? I know you're, you're still in your investigative phase, but uh, about the scope, I mean, are you talking about less than five cases, more than five cases? Just what are the parameters and specific details that you can give now about those clusters? Sure. So, so only aware of two affected individuals in the Rutland County. Um, but we're aware that there may be others who may have symptoms, so obviously we're awaiting testing there. And in Wyndham County, um, two adults and four children. Great. Um, and then finally, to, I wanted to follow up, um, Governor, with you on something you mentioned right at the, the very beginning of the press conference. Um, you spoke a little bit about how we might need to continue to place restrictions to smother the embers of this virus. Um, you know, in the early days of this pandemic, you, you kind of signaled a lot to Vermonters about when you might be placing new restrictions on the state. And I'm wondering, are, are you doing that here? Is there anything that's happening that you're seeing as, as concerning that might cause you to uh, restrict some of the opening that we've been seeing in the state right now? No, not at all, and not at this point in time. I'm just forecasting that uh, uh, that if we have to, we'll put those into place. But uh, at this point, uh, we're still opening up, and hopefully uh, we'll have some more announcements by the end of the week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at risk of being too much of a pessimist, I mean, can you sort of share a little bit about what might cause you to 
to, to go back and place some restrictions? I mean, what, what are the, the numbers that you're looking at? Um, or where would they have to reach? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you can look back uh, in terms of, of what we've done when we've reopened. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about more of a geographical, a number of geographical areas being impacted uh, with outbreaks. Uh, I am worried about the capacity of our healthcare system um, and, um, and just uh, the number of, of uh, positive uh, active cases and so forth. So <clears throat> again, we'll rely on the, on the data, rely on the health department team, the epidemiologists and, and others to determine when that is. But uh, at this point in time, I'm not seeing any any concern from my standpoint. Thank you. Steve, NEK TV. Can you hear me? Can. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, one for the doctor, one for the governor, if I may. Um, Dr. Levine, um, we've gotten a word up here that um, in the in the Kingdom area that there's been no testing of uh, nursing home employees. And given that, you know, the prevalence and danger to, uh, uh, to older folks, um, do you have any plans uh, for testing nursing home employees? I, I believe we have, uh, we have tested nursing home employees and we certainly have had pop-up testing in the Northeast Kingdom. In fact, I think there was some even today or uh, plan for today or tomorrow. But anyhow, I'll let Dr. Levine answer. So we have an entire um, group between the Department of Health and the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living um, putting together the kind of testing plan that you're talking about for the future. But the future is kind of now. Um, so yeah. the facility that you're referring to, I'm sure, hasn't um, had to do anything as of today. But we're working with all of the facilities around the state to actually implement um, plans where staff members and residents can undergo a testing protocol. Because we do recognize, just like you said, that these are the most vulnerable. So, so it's, it's coming soon. So it's coming soon, absolutely. Uh, now they should you. they should uh, have still been able to um, implement their um, sort of summertime out in the open air uh, visitation policy, uh, which we announced last week uh, in anticipation of actually the Father's Day weekend. Um, but part of the reopening of nursing homes and long term care facilities as we're calling that, uh, part of that reopening is actually um, tied into more aggressive testing protocols. Okay, soon then, thank you. Um, Governor, um, are, is, the, is the state still running the non-compliance reporting line and website? Um, I'll ask um, Commissioner Sherling, I believe that's still up, Mr. Sherling. That's correct, Governor. It is, uh, it is still up, although the number of reports has uh, dramatically decreased over time. Okay, and uh, Commissioner Sherling, uh, when will we have uh, have access to the data? I mean, obviously, you'd probably want to remove the names uh, of the people reporting and things like that. But uh, when will uh, when will we be able to uh, maybe take a look at the uh, at the results or at the uh, at the aggregate of, uh, of of that program? We have been releasing that data on a rolling basis in response to a number of inquiries. So if you reach out to our uh, PIO, I'm sure he can get you the most recent numbers. Okay, and who would that be? Uh, Adam Silverman. Adam Silverman. Okay, great. All right. Thank you all very much. Courtney, Local 22. Hi, um, just a quick question in regards to, um, first, just the Winnie Sea and Burlington outbreak. I'm just wondering if testing is still available throughout the week. And um, additionally, 
In regards to outbreaks and smaller things like that, I'm wondering, in order to get tested, do you have to be living in that um, municipality where the outbreaks happen to be able to get tested? Um, I can answer the second part. You don't have to be a member of the community to get tested okay. there. If you want a test, you can get a test, even if you live in another mm -hmm. area of the state. Okay. And what is the, testing still being offered? Yeah, the first three days of this week, Monday through Wednesday, uh, testing is available in, in Winooski at the uh, O'Brien Center, I believe. And Perfect. the last three days of this week, uh, testing is available in Burlington. Thank you. I should note that there's other pop-up testing uh, throughout the state oh, as well, uh, not just in Winooski and, and uh, in the Chittenden County area, mm -hmm. but uh, throughout the state. Great. Thank you. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Hello, thanks for taking my call. My question is about the border with Canada. Are there any instances or circumstances in which people are allowed to travel through Canada or into Canada, perhaps to visit a sick family member or, yes, are there any, what, what are the guidelines? Yeah, I believe, I, the, yeah, Lisa, I believe there, there are, um, but I don't know uh, what, uh, what the circumstances are, uh, but uh, but I th it's fairly limited. Um, but I believe uh, that you can. Um, is anyone on the line that may have the answer to that for Lisa? If not, we can get it for you or point you in the right direction. That would be great. Hearing none, we'll get you the answer to that. Okay, thank you very much. That's it. Okay. Well, again, thank you very much for tuning in, and we'll see you on Wednesday.